Alex, did you ever see Hanzo the Razor that I recommended to you some time ago? You did. You did. I have not seen it yet. <laughs> okay. Um, I was thinking about that today when I was like prepping some info for Blade of the Immortal. Because this is this is Chambara cinema. They're like sword fighting movies that were popu- popularized in the 70s. Mm-hmm. It went into like a lot of exploitation territory, like Lone Wolf and Cub and the Hanzo the Razor trilogy, which is just fucking bonkers. I was going to say, these past few months, I think I've had my fill on samurai sword slashing movies for a bit, but I'll, I'll have to watch Hanzo. Yeah, it's not very samurai-ish. It's mostly just, just insane. <laughs> um, but you mean you mean because we watched 13 Assassins and this? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, both by Takashi Miike. Yeah, I have to agree with that. <laughs> like, this is uh, even... I love this content and this type of world, but Jesus. It was like, by the end of this, I was like, I felt so overly saturated with this universe. It does bludgeon you a bit to where you get a little bit numb towards the end, because it's two and a half hours, and it is just chock full of gore <laughs> and sword fighting and murdering. Yeah, I mean, let's. I mean, it's definitely something that I want to talk about as far as the pacing and how to do a story because this is not how to do a story. <laughs> it's a bonkers one. So to set this one up, welcome back to the most professional film podcast on the internet, <laughs> as we we have a two and a half white men from California ramble about movies for way too goddamn long. Today we're talking about Blade of the Immortal by Takashi Miike, and this is our first like repeat i believe directorial wise um except for the uh director spotlights i don't think we've done two movies by the same director i think so So, yeah uh, Yeah, and i didn't plan on choosing this one i just saw it and i was like this movie (laughs) is bonkers this movie is so much fun and so ridiculous that i need to get the guys to watch it so i just chose it on a whim after watching it on a whim myself uh yeah so (laughs) what you guys think of (laughs) blade of the immortal I I loved it. I really I I loved it in a way that I didn't think I would. I thought it was adorable. It, it, so I'm a big fan of anime and manga and <clears throat> all of this type of content and when I was started to watch this I was I was confused and I realized like I'm the I'm the friend who I always try to introduce to this type of content at that moment, if that makes any sense. Because I didn't know at first that this came from a manga. So the whole time I was watching it, I was like, this feels like it should be a manga. <laughs> this feels like it should be an anime. It feels, <laughs> this content feels so crunched and dense. And what's going on here? Like I'm, It kind of became distracting. It went from like fun to distracting to kind of what you said, Jesse, kind of just numb i was like okay here we go but you are having fun the whole time yeah it's fun it's just like it just became where the story became so disjointed and all the threads just came loose and it's such a long fight scene such a long fight scene at the end yeah i liked it in a way where it has a lot of flaws but it was still a fun watch like most live action adaptations of mangas and animes yeah, when I was watching it, I was like, this has to be an anime. And I didn't even realize what this movie was when I started it. I was just like, I saw it on whatever streaming service, and I was like, that looks fun. And then it started, and I was like, oh, Takashi Miike. <laughs> okay. And then you have, you know, some dismemberment right off the bat. I love, by the way, the reaction shots of hands falling to the ground in this movie. There's probably <laughs> like 20 of them. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I had to look it up at the end. I was like, this has to be an anime. It wasn't, but it was um, a well-known manga series, I, I guess, by Hiroaki Samura. So I actually saw that it was an anime before I started watching it um, and that it was adapted from a manga. And that helped a lot with like the stylization of it. Um, I don't think I needed it because I also thought it was very fun and enjoyable. 
Um, there's a small point I want to say too about watching at least his films, Mikay's films, is that if you're watching like 13 Assassins as like a historical drama and then you see a wave, a tidal wave of fake blood, you know, <laughs> fly over a house, it can be kind of unsettling, but he does such a good job of binding you into the, the world that it's like, this is the way that things are going to be in this film. So it's not unsettling. And with this movie in the very first fight scene, there's, you know, where uh, Manji is like, He's like fighting through that huge crowd of people. Yeah, at in the very black be- and white. Yeah, at the very beginning. Um, there's a moment where he flings his sword up because he's just impaled someone with it. And the body just goes flying like if it weighed like two pounds. <laughs> yep. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, this is it. This is going to be fun. <laughs> yep. You know? Yep. So there's some level of almost like power ranger like villain effects that i see in this movie that i really liked it's not like that bad but i'm just like huh some of these villains i could see being in like a almost like a children's action story this movie could be for for kids in a way that like the storyline is very easy to follow and like it's very much like a live anime adaptation to the t yeah, exactly. It's like live action anime grindhouse. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I totally agree, Alex. It has this aesthetic to it where as someone who didn't know about the 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 manga before watching it, it was I kept comparing it to the Roroni Kenshin move, live action movies where I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, this feels like the Kenshin movies that really they really pump up the saturation so the colors are very vibrant and bright the characters are very ridiculous and of course when you right away when you get the the you know samurai magic and the and all that kind of stuff you're like okay i see what this anim with this i almost said anime with this uh, with this movie jesus <laughs> there what, is what content are we talking about here talking about with this movie is Way trying to do long. is is it's really trying to lean hard into I guess I, w- I don't want to say fan service, but what made the manga interesting to the fans of the manga? And as someone who didn't watch it, I was like kind of confused. But then you kind of start to fall in love with particular characters, and and certain characters are unbelievably ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> the, the structure great. definitely is very anime. It has that um, it has that s- sort of pacing where you could see this being episodic, really. Yep. What that and like. There, it's basically a series of boss battles, right? Yes. Like sub boss battles, and that's very, very anime these days. Well, yeah, that's um, the tr- probably the, always has. Yeah, that's been. the traditional like, uh, like you know, Bleach style, like Shonen yeah. Jump, Shonen anime Jump stuff is like you have the 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 protagonist, usually an antihero, protecting the weak one. Like this is almost like the the Bleach story, you know? Like it's it's yeah, Samurai yeah, Shampoo. Yeah, you have. And he now has to fight like the ten bad guys. And he it's funny because there's even winks to that. Or not winks because, you know, these these are just content that share in the same type of universe. But uh, one of the bad guys, he's like, he beat one of our ten sword ten best swordsmen. And in Japanese, ten is Jupon. And in in Roni Kenshin, the the people he has to fight are called the Jubongatana, the Ten Swords. So it's like it's the mm. content is so not derivative, but just so, exists in the same world of creative influence that it can't help but mirror each other at times, and in a way that's beneficial, in a way that like makes it familiar and fun and something you immediately recognize and go, okay, I'm on board with this universe. Yeah, it's half anime and half Chanbara like Grindhouse, and yeah. it's a wonderful mix that. You don't take it seriously. You see that everyone has like anime haircuts and mm-hmm. oh my god, the wigs in this movie, dude. They're they're great. Yeah. I was thinking about like some of the action scenes and I wanted to compare it. To, I was going to say it was like 13 Assassins cranked up to 11, but 13 Assassins was already the like, cranked up to 11. <laughs> so it's like cranking it up to 20. There's just fields of corpses bookending this movie. Yeah, well, the, it, it hits a lot of tropes, you know? Like, there's a lot of... This movie's very trope-heavy. Like, one of the tropes, obviously, is the one guy versus a thousand, where it's like, obviously, in a in a real fight, you would all just rush the guy at once, 
and kill him immediately. Uh, so there's like, but that's a, that's a trope in this type of content that is entertaining and fun to watch. It's fun to watch the hero batter himself against the wall against just waves and waves of just meat fodder. And, <laughs> and it's, it, it's really great. And I love what you said, Jesse, where it, it, this movie is very much a series of boss battles because it's very much indescript Japanese men with swords and highly stylized, very obvious. It's like every boss in this game is like a custom <laughs> character in a video game. Yes, yeah. Oh, Some no. like over-the-top fighting game. You can tell when like a character is important because they aren't dressed like an NPC. Exactly. Right. You're like, oh, <laughs> that's a cool coat. Or like, oh, where can I get that? Like, well, um, like your hair is a cool color. Exactly. Yeah. Like, You're like, that's totally... Totally how they dressed in in that era of Japan, I'm sure. It was, See, that's the thing. With the bleached hair and everything, bleached spiky hair. Is that Thirteen Assassins? Is like was Takashi Miike's like, okay, I'm gonna do my Akira Kurosawa style like Japanese epic. That's gonna mm. be very. It's gonna be very close to real life, and it's gonna be almost like historical. Um, but it's also gonna have my flair in it. Whereas this movie is more like. I'm going to build like a almost fantastical anime history of Japan and the environment that is like, it's more symbolic than it is concrete. If that makes sense, oh, you totally. know, cause no one wore their hair like that in that feudal Japan. No one wore bright blue colored kimonos like the leader of what is his name? Kagehisa. Oh, yeah, he's the leader of the Ito Ryu. <laughs> like he, they're the assassins, the yeah, baddies, not you know. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I don't know. I love that aspect of it, but oh, it's yeah. like when Japanese animators get their hands on a classic Japanese tale of literature, and then they storyboard it, right? And they're like, okay, this is what all these different people are going to look like. Blah 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 blah. And then you get a movie like this, and. I personally think that Mikke did it very well. Like he stuck the landing and whatnot. It doesn't really have a strong, strong narrative plot structure. It but, gets a little muddy towards the end, definitely. Yeah. Where you're but like, nonetheless, what's the point of this exactly? Well, yeah, it's a, right. It, it's a story that's supposed to be stretched out. I mean, the anime is twenty-four episodes. The manga is a decent size. I mean, this is obviously a very compressed and dense story. To mm-hmm. to what you're saying. Did you guys have a favorite boss out of those boss battles? That was oh, like the so first hard, the dude. first question I came up with. Probably Ooh. the first guy like with the, the heads. with the heads. Like he was just so over the top and so anime. Yeah. And so like like edgy and mysterious and like he's these talking heads. He's got all these little um prayer flags that are like stapled to his like really old school like even even for the era we're talking about in this movie that armor he's wearing would be like in a museum like that's old school show like shogun armor like shogunate armor like it's and he's like very much a walking trope i don't know i i loved his character that's probably my favorite i agree (sighs) he was my favorite too i'm gonna make a video game comparison that's me instead of jeff this episode nice but he felt very dark souls to me Oh, he's Sekiro, got this like dude. shell of Sekiro, oh, yeah, Sekiro yeah, as well. Sekiro. Same same company um, that made yeah, Dark same Souls. company. But just the like, he felt like under the surface of the character, there's like some mysticism or like lore you could tease out or something. And probably the fact is. that he had the yeah, probably is. Um, but the fact that he had the mother's or the the daughter's mother, like the little girl's mother, as like one of these heads that mm-hmm. lives under a sheet on his shoulder. You're just like, wow, this is so anime. Oh, I yep. know. I, I love that <laughs> aspect. And like, I think what you said about teasing out lore is like the crux of how this movie functions successfully. Right. It's, it doesn't go too heavy into explaining all of these different characters, but it's just enough that you get no, like this yeah. vibe. Like the, even the guy with the, where's the face mask, which disclaimer, I just want to say it's hilarious that his face mask looks so like the face masks that people wear nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's <laughs> weird how the whole, that whole aesthetic has changed. Like, it's no longer cool, I think. Yeah, it's not like ninja I'm like, yeah, like, oh, this guy's going to the grocery like, store. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> yes, but th- dude. That guy was pretty cool, but I will say I think I liked the guy with the gray hair. The like kind of um the other immortal guy. Oh yeah. he was obviously throwing his voice the entire fucking time. It, you could see his neck muscles working really hard to yeah. voice. <laughs> I liked his I like just he reminded me of a classic anime character. You're like kind of mysterious. You obviously look different than everyone else, so you know that you're important. You have this weird like interaction or altercation with the main characters and then he, he's like a lot more powerful than he comes off being at the beginning you know yeah. and then he like he sets up a conflict for the main character which i thought was important because after a while it was going to be boring if she was just going to run around with this invincible meat grinder of a bodyguard right you wanted some conflict within him it's like what is he what are the stakes for him and him interacting with this character and it's slowing the rejuvenation, the blood worms or whatever. Yeah. That mm-hmm. made things urgent for the main character. And I was like, okay, that makes it more interesting. He also kind of had to figure out his dimensionality where it's like, do I want to die? Yes. But I is know that more important now <laughs> than protecting this young lady who reminds me of my sister. Exactly. Cause at first I was like, dude, you got it. You did it. This guy just cured you like your your issue, you know? What if that was the end of the movie? He just <laughs> commits suicide like an hour and a half in. <laughs> He's just like, oh, this is awesome. Well, good luck like, finding your revenge. Just stabs himself through his own face. In yeah. Kashi Miike style. <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of good to say about this movie and i think we've we all kind of on the same page where it was it's enjoyable and fun. But I mean, there is because we do review movies and we do have to kind of be critical sometimes. And there is a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, there is quite a bit wrong structurally with this movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, I find a lot of the acting to be subpar as far as like a lot of the side characters or like the other bosses, if you will, especially that of like the love interest of the antagonist, the, uh, the girl with the, the like crooked cane, she mm-hmm. was very undercooked, yeah. Yeah, she was just very, like, one-dimensional, and I just mm-hmm. didn't find... Same with um, what was supposed to be kind of, like, the po- the politician guy who's, like, the, the guy's eating rice balls during the... Oh, the yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, He's just methodically yeah. eating rice balls as he watches hundreds of people get slaughtered by our main characters. It's like, <laughs> it's uh, so it's funny. Hand, is, is this heavy? Like, is uh, it was kind of a heavy-handed moment there. Uh, but there was, I think... It has a testament to what Alex is saying is just like in an anime, just like in a manga, just like in anything like this, you, it's it's very much about like the context and, and the situation. I always find like these stories are trying to say something bigger, but when you try to condense it into a, a two and a half hour, which is quite a dense movie length as it is, as Jesse, you were saying, it, it gets real muddy where the story I felt was easy enough to follow but i could see where it was just so disjointed and broken you had this kind of political drama with the main antagonist Uh trying to take over and make his school the number one school and and yet that story seems to always kind of take a back seat to the main story this revenge tale and it's stuff that you really want to see fleshed out because both of them seem very interesting and they just end up conflating into this 40 minute bloodbath that ends in a way that was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I think what they were trying to do with that was to show that the the girl and the main bad guy are both kind of outcasts, but it was a very sloppy way of doing it to where I'm having to guess because I'm not quite sure. The core of the movie, and I think like what what makes it win beyond being like a fun grindhouse anime, is the I, I really like the relationship between um, let me see Manji and Rin. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you guys felt about that. Uh, oh, I, I definitely. Mean, it, it was fleshed out properly and it, it, it felt convincing. And I mean, as we usually say with, uh, you know, the type of foreign movies we watch, it, t- it tends to be that the child actors really kill it. And uh, Rin's ac- the actress who plays Rin was very convincing and did a solid performance. And yeah, yeah I agree. So she was cast because of her enthusiasm in a instant Chinese stir fry commercial that Mike saw. Nice. I would have <laughs> yeah. figured that she was in some of his like magical girl movies. Oh no, it was just like 
he's probably up late one night, you know, snacking on simbe or something like that, which is Japanese rice cracker for anyone who doesn't know. <laughs> it was just like, oh <laughs> shit, this chick is going to be in my next movie. <laughs> Here's just point out real quick. We did point this out before, but it's so strange that Takashi Miike makes these type movies and also makes magical girl movies. I mean, he's he made has 100, like, though, right? He's, so like, he's made about 100 films What is a magical more. girl movie? I'm not familiar. Um, do you remember I had you look at the poster for his latest film on our 13 Assassins oh, yeah, episode. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like little girls with like pink. Yeah. It's like Sailor Moon type of stuff. You well, know? The, the, I'm, and you know, you guys are going to have to fill me in. So these movies, Takashi Miike movies and such, are Japanese produced and directed. And I mean, these are totally foreign pictures. They're Japanese They're production. They're totally yeah. independent producers. This has nothing to do with Hollywood. Other yeah, than right. the money, Warner Brothers helps produce. They have like Japanese sections of sure, their sure, production sure, sure. companies. But as far as like this, like there was no studio in LA that this was shot on or anything like. No, oh, no. I was actually really interested. I was trying to find out what the budget of this was, I think it was because I million? felt uh, that's that was how, that's how much it made. Oh, okay. but in scouring the internet, I was unable to find the. It's hard budget, but my my guess is that it wasn't much. I would say a couple million tops. Because one of the things I wanted to point out in terms of the filmmaking in this is I think he's doing an amazing job with a low budget. And I wondered if you guys had the same thought. For example, not not just the rubber hands flying, the hilarious rubber hand shots when mm-hmm. people get uh, their hands cut off. But during the more intense action sequences... It didn't look like, and I made this comparison before to like Yimu Zhang, where it's like um, the the fluidity with which he shoots action and the impact with like at whenever a sword hits. This one, there's much more editing involved. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the sword hits or like death blows kind of thing will happen out of shot, yep. like oh, out yeah. of frame of the shot. So it, you have to kind of use your imagination. I was like, ah, I think what he's doing here is using his budget effectively. You know what I mean? Oh, yes. yeah. There's a lot of off-camera healing. There's a lot of times where he drops his swords, like, you know, because he has this kind of, you know, this is, again, why an anime context is important because, you know, the main character is it basically carries on him all of these blades <laughs> yes. of his defeated victims. Mm-hmm. Uh, of like, basically, anytime he kills a boss, he, like, takes their weapon and then can summon it, kind of, but... In the way that Takashi Miki likes to ground his stories, he didn't try too hard at all to do that. He definitely let the magic flow. But I think in that context, he was trying to maybe ground a little, a little bit as like the main character just kind of has these on him because there's that little scene when he's like sprinting and he drops one and he like goes yes. back and picks it up. I have that like, in my notes. I have <laughs> that in my notes. Yes. Running and a 10 pound throwing star falls out of his kimono and he has to go back and pick it up. And I laughed. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, uh, there's definitely a lot of that, but I mean, I agree. There's a lot of off camera um, throwing down of the swords or taking the swords out. I mean, I, I think this is how you use a small budget effectively, where I didn't need to see those scenes. Now, well, I will complain about with the editing, to your to your point, Jesse, is that I do feel like Takashi Miki thrives in big, wide battle shots where there's just a lot of chore- choreography. I felt the choreography was very lacking in this movie, which is could be a testament to the low budget. But um, it was done yeah, on a very and, and, short time schedule, and there was a lot of quick cuts in the fights, which are always just very distracting for me. Like a lot of tight shots, wide, uh, um, you know, very tight frames, and then quick cut, quick cut, quick cut. I mean, it's like, damn, dude, let me just rest on a scene for just a few minutes. Yeah, it doesn't feel as mannered as Thirteen Assassins. It doesn't feel as quite as classy or as well done as that. That's definitely the um, the the anime to film live action translation i feel like because in anime there are those like quick cuts of like someone's weapon or like them flying through the air or they deliver a death blow and you just see like the reaction of the anime characters like face you know their Mm -hmm. eyes widen or something which is cool but with live action it's really disorienting because there's no way you could stay on a shot and have it be artistic or aesthetically pleasing enough to look like a drawn anime battle right because that's a great 
Yeah, that's a great observation, dude. Like, I mean, yeah, continue. Sorry, I just, I really wanted to, to respond to that point. Um, but I think that you're right about it being much more compressed. Whereas, like, if we were talking about 13 Assassins, it was like a landscape of a battle. Whereas this one, it was almost like at the beginning, even, it was like we were fighting in the hallway. Or, like, as a camera, we were placed underneath, like, the armpit of one of the people <laughs> fighting. You know? That's so perfect. <laughs> Dude, this is such a good read you're having here. Like, because I didn't think about it that way. I was just like, oh, it's quick cuts because it's like, action and you know like it's i don't know like there's so much going on that they have so much content to use that they're just like quick cut quick cut but your read is interesting because you're like the oh maybe they're trying to adapt it off an anime style and you're very correct in that kind of assumption because you know animation's super expensive so in mm-hmm. anime you use a lot of quick cuts because it saves a lot of money because you don't have to make these fully animated that's why the newest Castlevania on Netflix. I highly recommend that for anyone who's just oh, that show is sweet. A yeah. new a fan of animation in general because the animations of the fights in that movie are unbelievable. A uh, movie, sorry, uh, show are unbelievably beautiful. They're long and sweeping, and there's no quick cuts. They're like these huge mm-hmm. long takes, and that's expensive <laughs> shit. Yeah, and so it's like I like your read because it's almost like are they kind of using that aesthetic to also save money. Like, oh, if we make these action scenes a lot like the anime, we can also save money on a little uh, tell, not show type of thing. So I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. It's it's just an interesting read. I really like it. The very small viewing space for me, like the perspective, the crunch down thing, for every single battle in Blade of the Immortal... I didn't know who was receiving the death blow like when they collide, right? The two characters Mm -hmm. collide and you hear like a gasp or you hear blood splatter. It's so much like anime where I'm like, okay, who got hit here? And then it cuts to like a commercial, right? Or like it's like next episode. (laughs) Next (laughs) week on Dragon Ball Z. Exactly. It cuts to like the character, one of the characters who has blood on their blade. Yeah. Uses a lot of those tropes very effectively in a way that doesn't come off as corny, at least in my opinion. No, after a hundred movies, Takashi Miike knows what he's doing. (laughs) He knows knows how to make the best of what he's got. I will say. He definitely tried, yeah. The biggest flaw for me is I think you guys are definitely right about the trope heaviness. The flaw for me is reading some of the notes about why he decided to do this story. And he talks Mm. about how he feels like he didn't see it a lot. He said it was a genre that he felt like he didn't see a lot. And it was a, it was like the anti-hero wasn't something he saw a lot. And he was talking about how Mm. it was unique. And I thought that it wasn't that way. I thought it was kind of like overcooked in a sense that I'm like, okay, I'm used to all of these characters and going way back to Jesse's point about the relationship between Rin and Manji. I also feel like that's a very highly used trope that I see a lot. I could not agree more with what you're saying. I don't, I think this movie is emblematic of so many cliches. It just doesn't matter because it's like, it's fun. It's oh, fun yeah, in this yeah. context. Like, it's all about context, right? And I know not none of us are saying this is, like, a detriment. It's just, it is what it is. It's a live-action grindhouse anime, and it ticks all these anime boxes yeah. to the point where it's, like, none of this is super unique except for the fact that it is a Takashi Miike version of this that's hyper-violent. And I don't even think it was too gratuitous, though. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, yeah, I mean, it, Takashi Miike has his style of violence, I think. He's very much like a blood splatter kind of guy. He's not much like the gore in this. There's not. There's no spilling of bowels. There's no, you know, brains. There's not many decapitations. It's mostly just like blood splatter, slices in the good guy spot, and uh, and, you know, cuts and stuff like that. There's certainly nothing quite as... as impactful or dark as some of the things in um 13 assassins like when you see the the amputee girl and stuff like that Mm -hmm. this movie doesn't go that dark so it's it's, it is mostly just 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 sword fighting blood yeah yeah it's it's supposed to be a like to alex's point about this easily being a kid's quote-unquote movie (laughs) as far as you can (laughs) say 
is uh, where it has the feeling of something that is a manga, which is a essentially, you know, a comic book, and which is something to appeal to younger people and older people. I'm not saying older people can't be into comics. Plenty of older people are, and uh, but it has that feel to it, where yeah. it's much more suited for a fan, a fantastical type universe. I will say, not, not his style. Yeah, go ahead. I mean that in a very positive way too. Exactly, it's yeah. like a very appeal based. Like you could sit down and watch it with like your ten year old kid and yourself, <laughs> and he would come away, he or she mm. would come away with an understanding of how the film works. And what the storyline was, and would come away with it being like, that was really fun. The adult, too, would come away with it, their own understanding of how the film works and the story works, but would also be like, dang, that was really fun to watch. Um, so I think that's like a good thing that it does. And yeah, then I agree. I think that I had a question for you guys, and you guys kind of brought it up with the dropping of the. <laughs> the throwing star but there's like comedy put in this movie right it's supposed to be oh, funny yeah, at certain sure. times yeah, okay for sure movie's funny because i was laughing oh, yeah. in a good way where i was like huh did the array of bladed weaponry that exists within his kimono is so <laughs> ridiculous <Yeah. laughs> it, it's funny in the same way that 13 assassins while a very like serious and at times dark movie tried to do comedy and it did it like i think i mentioned this episode there was like three comedy yeah, scenes that you yeah, could you count mm -hmm. and they were all funny like when takashi Miike does funny it's subtle and it works every yeah. time like every time this movie was supposed to make you laugh i laughed every little line that was supposed to be funny like when he like he, you know he cuts off his own hand and he's about to leave and he realizes he doesn't have his hand yeah and he has to, like, <laughs> and it's all quiet they cut all the music and he's like kind of like wrestling with the chain and he's like, fucking thing and yeah just, like, like, like that was hilarious <laughs> that was really good and it made me i was like laughing out loud in a good way because you love that juxtaposition between just absurdity. It's like he has to go get his hand. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> I love how to... <laughs> have to reattach it. Our main and player it flops very thing. fake. It's a very flop. Like It's almost like a testament to like how it's obvious. Like It's almost like Takashi Miike winking and breaking the fourth wall. Like, yes, this, I don't have much money, so all this is going to look fake. Because the way the hand flops down the hill is so rigid <laughs> and fake looking. And I think at that point, he's like, yeah, we're just going to like make it quite obvious that this is <laughs> I, what this is. I was thinking about that. I was like, I wonder if he was laughing when he was filming this. And like I said earlier, there's like 20 of those rubber hand reaction shots where you don't see the hand get cut off like in frame. You just see it like flying after the cutting. <laughs> yeah, it's great. There's like on the end battle, there's just like a lot of them just scattered about the battlefield. If you're paying attention, like there's like just a bunch of like hands with swords and they all almost look like the same like manufacturer. They're all from like the, the same, same one. Mold. They're all from yeah, the same like, like plastic <laughs> just the same one that they have that they just keep resetting in yeah. different positions. Like they're, I kept looking for that because I agree, Jesse, there was times where I was like, okay, this movie feels drawn back it doesn't feel as as much of a grand production as something he like 13 assassins so where are the imperfections like i was waiting like uh we you know the famous scene in uh the, i think it's the second where star, star wars the new of the newest when they like kill snoke and they have that fight scene and like all of the imperial guards are like just flying back even though they're not even like getting hit at all it's just so <laughs> horribly choreographed i was looking for stuff like that and yet I couldn't find it. Like all of the extras seem to know like their place and when to fall and when to react to being hit. So again, like this is content that when done by other directors and live action animes or live actions of animes and mangas fall really quickly. How does, how does this stack up Jeff? Cause you're, I think you've seen more of those things than we have. I've barely seen any of them. I've like live most, action anime. Yeah, things. Most of I've seen most of live action versions of any anime that I like. I haven't seen all of them obviously, but I mean, it's good. Well, I was just about to say that it's like, it's something I think in the hands of an other director that we would not like because the story is condensed and dense and sometimes like stumbles over itself. But I mean, it's just a testament to being such a great director. Takashi Miki takes this content and makes something that's fun and enjoyable to watch, and you can see his skill. So I think it it rates up there pretty high. There's a there's a really high level of competence to this movie, and 
and yes. thought <laughs> and, and I and, love that competence. Yeah, yes. And just like thought and emotion. And then, you know, you're dealing with a crowd that is very, I don't know, uh, passionate about this type of content. And there's a lot of blade of the immortal adaptations. There's multiple anime movies. I mean, this is content that people love. And I think Takashi Miike, I don't know if he's an anime fan, but I think he just, he took this and did well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he would take this as a compliment and without trying to pigeonhole him too much into his own nation's film literacy and history, I feel like Takashi Miike has done a very good job with the idea that Akira Kurosawa would have done the same type of films had he had the technology available to him. And I think Miike has done a really good job of carrying a tradition obviously with his own stamp and style on it anyone who's seen ichi the killer or audition wouldn't be like oh this is like a kira kurosawa masterpiece you know right. it's like <laughs> it's it's just he does things so competently like jeff said and he does things so well in directing like he he directs so many different people in his films that it's like you couldn't you can't watch his movies and think that he's a bad director. He he organizes these huge projects that turn into these films that, I don't know, that somehow, I feel like they have recipes for disaster, like each of his films does. Like, we're going to do a giant Japanese history production. We're going to do an anime, highly stylized adaptation. And he's just hit the mark on pretty much every single one. Um Really quick, too, this is jumping back a little bit. I want to say how much I love that our character, our protagonist, is like some immortal swordsman who has to deal with the inconveniences of everyday stuff, like dropping your weapon and things like that. I think that that right. little injection of comedy really helped the film. Well, yeah, he's, he's immortal, but like he's not... A superhero, exactly. It's, I think, a very big trope. Like, uh, it's almost like a trope buster uh-huh. that this movie does, where it's like, yes, we have a hero, and I mean, that's to the testament of the writer of the manga, is that you know you have a hero that is essentially no different than any other scumbag <laughs> uh, killer in the movie. Essentially, I mean, he kills for good, I guess. I know, but <laughs> he kills because he likes a certain little girl. Yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> In the sense that he's, you know, he's very much an, an anti-hero and it grounds him in that way that is, is funny. And, and and then that echoes back to Takashi Miike's skill where he goes, okay, I'm going to use that and I'm going to create little scenes where showing him as a real person. Like I'm going to drop his weapon and get drunk on sake and doesn't have any money. Like he's still just like kind of like a vagrant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, before I, before I, um, before we started this, I was thinking about framing it in the way that Alex framed the 13 Assassins discussion where he's like, is this movie good <laughs> or is it like, how did you say it? You're like, or is this just like horrible garbage somehow, but that we still love it? I don't know. I think this one rides the line more so yeah, than definitely. that one did. That one feel, felt more classy, like we said before. This one is much more genre, uh-huh. I suppose. Yeah. And like when we say it's a grindhouse live action adaptation of an anime. It's not like we're saying it's like that. It is that Uh, it it is is that. that. And if you try and like go into this film with any other, maybe expectation, you may be not disappointed, just off put, but yeah, this film is so fun that I, I really feel like it'll work for anyone. Oh, yeah, and there's, there's so many funny little things, like, if you're paying attention that you can point out, like, like does does the main character just have a hundred of these kimonos, or does he <laughs> yes. just have the best soap in the world that gets rid yes. of blood stains? Because, like, he gets in these fights where he's just, like, torn to tatters and shreds and blood soap. His kimono and has then, blood worms, too. Wait, isn't that what Rin is for? <laughs> he's like, oh, now I have like, a girl that can sew all I just my love the idea of, like, this 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 is badass antagonist who carries around like a luggage case full of his like <laughs> replacement kimonos. They should have had that in the movie. That would have <laughs> been great. Like it's just stuff like that is so hilarious. 
there's a little moment where he takes the hilt off one sword and affixes it oh, to his yes. other sword. And yes. that was like, I was just like, fuck yes. Yes, dude. All that <laughs> shit is so badass. Like when he's using weapons differently, like, like his fight choreography is great, but certain other actors just don't sell it as like a warrior. Like mm. most of like, and then I kind of want to mention, I really wanted to mention at the end where <laughs> it's kind of like a really fast wrap up because it's like here come all the characters oh, that know. we didn't tie yeah, up I know. <laughs> so like you got like fucking the antagonist love interest like she comes back in and fights at his side you're like where's this bitch coming from and then you have like shira who has now white hair mm-hmm. for some reason that probably yeah. only fans of the manga know uh manji cut off his hand and that turned his hair bleached yeah. yeah like who knows like and then he turns his bones of his arm into like a stabbing weapon like yes it just loses the <laughs> thread so heavy at the end of the movie i'm okay with it sure it bananas just like, he just and then like all of a sudden sure he like that same character just comes from riding a horse in the middle of the battle like i'm here too so <laughs> it just was ridiculous i was confused at the end okay so you know the chick that fights with the villain uh i think her name is maki she's the one with the curved like pointed like almost chinese looking style weapon that uh the girl stands up to and is like you can't but, kill manji because he's protecting me you know who i'm talking about yeah that's the scene where he does the double blade i was talking about yeah where yeah, they're in, yeah they're in the, the that's town. the yeah that's uh, uh anotsu's like love interest so like the geisha she's like she's obsessed with staff. Him, right like yeah. she so at the end though she's fighting for him and she like sacrifices herself right Mm -hmm. okay so i I was like why did we even put this whole thing in where she's like thinking about oh maybe i've been fighting for the wrong cause blah 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 and then at the end like you said it kind of like they brought her back and i was like oh we're gonna see like the resolve of all of that and it just didn't resolve the way i thought it would the the morality was completely twisted around i know wait a minute bad guys the bad guy's a good guy or at least not a bad guy but we still want to kill him but we kind of don't but then we end up doing it and then yeah what what was she like what was the point of her at all so other than to have like another sub boss that you fought you could have cut that whole thing out yeah yeah that's true those tropes get tiring you know like one one that was like done so overdone as well is like the whole like person walks away and then you call back after them and then run towards how dare you walk away from me like there's so much of that shit where it became so taxing and and Mm predictable like especially the ending where i mean spoilers obviously um you know like you think that the hero is dead Mm -hmm. just suffered all these grievous wounds and then like i was like she's like saying his name saying his name and i was like oh my god just call him brother already so he can Big fucking brother. come back to life and we <laughs> can end the movie and she was like and then she kept saying his name i was like all right just call it. like we all know where this is going dude like just call him brother so we can fucking credits <laughs> that is true i'm okay with it yeah i was too. I'm okay with all of the cliches in this movie. it totally satisfied me it like wet my appetite for a, it's a like film watcher I yeah, it's Total like Shogun co- like the construction <laughs> of it is like uh, it's almost like a comfy blanket kind of thing. You're like, ah, oh, that's cute. It's all these elements that you know, but just wrapped up in the hyper violence of Takashi Miike. Yeah, and like I I see that it has all these flaws, but I didn't care at all <laughs> when watching it. You know, you know, it is yeah. too long though. It, it is too. It long. is pretty. The, thing. the fight scene at the end, I was like, okay. The fight scene at the end is 36 minutes long. The problem with that fight scene is that it doesn't have the texture of something like the 13 Assassins fight scene. Like we talked about that in detail where it has all these different storylines going on yeah. and all these different emotional tenors that it's operating on so that it's like it's this complex spider web of narrative. Whereas this one is just kind of a mess. <laughs> yeah. It's a big, violent, long, brutal mess. Yeah, well, 13 Assassins takes this trope that we were just talking about of the the one guy versus the 10 swordsmen, you know, and and it flips it on its head where it's like, no, the 10 swordsmen versus the universe. Multiplies it mm-hmm. exponentially. And so that's what makes it interesting. Whereas in in this, it's like it's a it's a trope that you're so fucking familiar with. And the fact that the girl like never really develops her skill, that's always a very 
big leaned into anime trope of like you know the the whatever it is girl or boy the young protagonist never quite can become a badass yeah they always have to be less badass than the hero like it's just it, it like you're saying jesse it ticks all the boxes yeah that's another element that could have been explored more maybe you cut out some of the fighting in the middle of the film and have more of like Rin being trained because there's a part where she goes into the forest and sees the bad guy Mm -hmm. has a little confrontation with him where um, Manji tells her to go train alone Mm -hmm. go train alone today and I was like oh he's training her Mm -hmm. because we hadn't seen anything like that so yeah I mean if you restructured it and had a little bit more character stuff in the middle and lowered the action quotient it might have been a little more palatable to, as two and a half hours. It definitely feels um like condensed, right? It feels like a season's worth of a manga. Mm-hmm. Definitely, like well, I, that raises the question: Do you think that that was a conscious decision on Mike's part to not indulge too much into the story and then have these narrative threads become t- like even more lost as? Because you can do that in these type of adaptations where if you try to delve too much into the hard details, it can become so muddled that it's just a mess and it can't even be understood. Or I don't know. I just think that that might have been a conscious decision for him to rein back on that and just embellish on the fight scenes a little bit. Maybe. Maybe he just really likes shooting crazy fight scenes. I think that's I think that's probably a big part there of it. too. Yeah. yeah. It's like if I can make an analogy to like food, Jeff, that you might understand. Oh, thanks. Dude, everyone's doing my job. I know. So, yeah, so. All right. But like think of like if you were preparing like a really fancy like what is how do you say that word? Is it haute cuisine? H A U T E. It's like a word they use for fancy cuisine, you know? Oh dude, I hate all of that shit. But like I'm the last person to ask about that. Imagine like if you had that, but it wasn't the small plate style. It was like claim oh, like jumper. Tapas? No, 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 no. Like imagine you have things that take like ten hours to prepare a dish that mm-hmm. takes like ten hours to prepare, but you have cafeteria style serving amount of it, right? Like <laughs> you have just like the oh, most yeah. beautiful filet mignon put in a chafing dish. Or something like yeah, that. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. This yes. movie knows its components well enough that it's just like, we're going to get you a bunch of Happy Meals. We're going to get you a bunch of cheeseburgers, <laughs> chicken nuggets, fries, and a soda because we know you like it. It's a bunch of smorgasbord of really simple, easy stuff, but it all works together and you're going to fucking love it, right? Yeah, it doesn't feel produced or yeah. like um, yeah. fake in the way that fast food does. This feels like... Like, if you get fast food style, but from, like, I don't know, uh, like, a place that uses real ingredients. I yeah, guess. I mean. Because it's Takashi Miike on a budget, like, making it because he fucking wants to. I'm thinking. And that shines through. Of, like, more of the spirit of when you go to get food. Like, when you're going to get, like, some fancy f- food or something, you have all these expectations, and you're going to have all these, like, critiques of the food and the way it was prepared or served. But when you get in your car... And you go to Jack in the Box or you go to McDonald's, you've made a pact with that decision where you're like, I know what I'm doing right now, and I know that I'm going to enjoy it. I know it's going to fulfill everything that I expect. And that's how I feel when I watch this movie. It's not fast food. This movie is delicious junk food. Yeah, exactly. I've never, I've never critiqued a Jack in the Box taco. Yeah, right. (laughs) No matter matter how much I like food. The most critiquing I will do is just be like, they didn't give me my fucking barbecue sauce, which happens way which too do, often, McDonald's. They didn't last night. Yeah. They didn't give me my fucking barbecue yeah. sauce last night. It was pissing me off when I got Jack in the Box. <laughs> I got fucking curly fries and they didn't give me barbecue sauce. Oh, I was going to say ta- tacos with uh, barbecue sauce no. from uh, Jack in the Box. No, same thing Bro, happened I'm, to me last I'm night. Still trying to sh- I'm still trying to shit somewhat solid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. No. I want Takashi Miike to make a Wolverine movie. I'm just going to put that out there. Oh, dude. But if like, he tried to say Like a Japanese style those. one? Yeah. Well, there's all these storylines where he goes to Japan. So that could be a great one for him. <laughs> but just like unleash Takashi Miike. Let him have a hard R rating and just see what he does with the Wolverine character. Well, would it still be huge? Uh, like, maybe it's time I for think a like, new iteration. It's time for a new one. You can't do it after Logan. Logan was such an incredible send off. We've had three or four different Spider-Mans since he started playing Wolverine. So I think it's okay. 
uh, for them to just start looking for like, you know, I don't want them to use the guy. Someone was talking about using the guy that they used for that Punisher show. And I think he's a good actor. He has like this Charles Bronson kind of like vibe to him, yeah. but I just don't want him to be the every tough guy like Tom Hardy. You know, I don't want him to be every single tough guy type of like kind of rugged hero. I always forget that actor's name, but I agree. He's better, uh, I think, as a supporting actor. Oh, definitely. Everything he's been in. Like Fury. Like when he was in Fury, yep, he was a great, he did great in that. But I, I don't, I think he could kind of fell flat in the Punisher show. He was like in The Wolf of Wall Street as one of his like little lackeys, you know, that helped train. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's, God, I haven't seen that movie in so long. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's like, yeah, he's a great supporting actor, but I just, I don't think he really, he's not a lead guy yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm trying to think, actually, who would be a Wolverine. Sorry for anyone who wants to still keep listening or talking about, what about Blade like, of the um, Immortal. <laughs> what about... Uh, um, we're good. Yeah, we're, we're done, done on that. Um, what about... Um, oh, God, I just had him. Um, he was in the, the Death Stranding game. But, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, not Man Norman Reedus. Walking Dead. Not Norman no, Reedus. Not Norman Reedus, the other guy. Do you just want uh, Benicio... Uh, not Benicio. God damn it. What Guillermo del Toro. It? No, no. Oh, Guillermo. <laughs> I forgot Guillermo was in Death Stranding. He was in that for as uh, Wolverine. No, that what was uh, what's awesome. his what's his name? He's got a really good name. People wanted him to be the Witcher over Henry Cavill in the in the beginning. Oh God, I have no idea. God, I Mads remember. Mikkelsen. I don't Mads know. Mikkelsen. Oh, Mads yeah, was it yeah, actually. Yeah. Oh my God, I thought yeah. that was like I didn't know that was. Right. I mean, he would yeah, be he good, Destiny, but yeah. he he'd be a good Wolverine. He's like a little too. I want someone not younger, I guess. But if we're gonna like throw him out into Japan, and it's like one of a, st- a story of him like growing or you know doing something in his. They youth. actually did that in the movie The Wolverine. I think it's like the 2013 one, but the the script is kind of a mess. It's not that great. The movie sucks. Yeah, that's what the first iteration of Deadpool. Well directed, terrible script. Yeah, no, Ryan Reynolds is Deadpool, and they like so. Oh no, not that one, not oh, okay. that one, not X Men Origins. That is terrible. Oh, okay, yeah, I was about that's to be like, Dude, what? <laughs> How do no, you the actually... 2013 one was directed by James Mangold, who did Logan. So oh, that's right. I didn't a, see. He's I a didn't quality see that filmmaker. One. Yeah, let's do Sasha Baron <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> Just with a Borat accent. <laughs> oh my god, bad Japanese accent. <laughs> oh god. I don't know. I think it would be cool if if Takashi Miike did Wolverine, but like with the Japanese actor that like none of us have ever heard. That would be tight, you know, just like he does, just like he does in all his movies. Like, why make it an American actor? Why not just like give it to one of these incredible actors that we see in his movies? Any one of those hard faced, yeah, seriously, (laughs) thirteen assassins Uh, could be Wolverine easily. (laughs) Unfortunately, it'll never happen. Maybe not the fat guy, but (laughs) he's a little too jolly. We can dream. Yeah, I don't know who'd be a good Wolverine. Just Patrick Stewart. What about just like let shit die, you know? Yeah. Oh, there's no way. There's so much money in Wolverine. Oh, yeah. You know, like what about just like making original ideas? Well, what about what happened to that? You know, the kids who like, I guess, or the people. Oh, here we go. Who were Old folks, get off my lawn. Just uh, introduced to X-Men when Hugh Jackman started playing it. If you wait like five or ten years and you come out with a new Wolverine, those kids who are now adults will be like, oh, fuck yeah, I need to see this, right? Regardless of if it's going to be good or not. So I think Jesse's right that we want to let things die, and I think all of Hollywood and even the audiences know that that is the right thing to do, just to let it die, but no one is going to give in to that endorphin rush of something being reintroduced from your childhood. Like, no one's going to resist that. And it's such a such a lucrative franchise. Oh God! I mean, X Men. Are you fucking kidding me? That is never going to die as long as we're around making them movie pictures. Uh, I can I can only hope that it just becomes like a corner of cinema and not like the dominant force like it is now. Yeah. I just hope that it's like kind of walled off into its own category, and we can have like more just diverse content diverse genres in film it'll go like we I do wanna... we have those great films released every day they're yes, just I you gotta dig that. around the money that's though not... if the money followed other genres as well or was a little more dispersed thank you i know you, what you're saying Alex. jesse the, oh you're talking about Jeff. the bit on the grand I'm the biggest yeah, on the big I'm just, stage i'm just talking about the interest in that like you were saying that this mc this a24 macbeth would never 
do well in major theaters. And that makes me really right. sad mm-hmm. because Definitely. it should, because that's content that also, I mean, again, this is a remake. You know, I'm being hypocritical here because how many fucking times have we remade Macbeth? Yeah. But so uh, more times than there are Marvel movies, that's for sure. So again, that's a little hypocritical and I want to, I would like to address that. But I mean, I just kind of want more interest in a wider variety of sim- cinema and I, I'd like to see that reflected in cinema again. Maybe I'm just looking through it like rose colored glasses from when I was younger and it seemed like there was much more to offer. No, now it's. Just I think like, you're right. I mean, <sighs> it just seems even, like so you're so limited on your choices. It's like, does every YA film or novel have to be about a girl who lives in a like dystopian world where they have some weird like gladiator style game? You know, like it seemed like after a while, it, like Divergent came out, The Maze Runner. You have the original Hunger Games. You know, this battle royale type thing. I was like, okay. Does it have to follow this formula? But it, it doesn't <laughs> matter anymore content-wise, right? Because they were just like, oh, it's just making money. We don't know why. Well, that's that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood money. in a nutshell. Yeah, like you get you get you get a a, a a type of movie that does really well, and they dig around in every possible dumpster yeah. <laughs> in order to find things that are like that to to do more. Yeah. You know. And I think after Lord of the Rings came out, you had so mm-hmm. many like little like Narnia movies, just anything that even fit the bill mm-hmm. at, in any way. In the name of the king. Yeah. In the name of the <laughs> <Exactly>. king. <laughs> yes, our, our favorite film. Um, but no, yeah, I think that this will go down, this moment of time will go down in like film uh, criticism history or film literature studies, you know. When they look at stuff like that, there will be... You know, because we look at the 70s and the 60s sometimes and we talk about exploitation films. We just know that that is a time then they, they seem to like pop up and be kind of popular. And I think when you look back a few decades, you can kind of be like, oh, you can see things clear, right? And you're like, okay, this is why people were really into these movies. You know, in the Great Depression, you had movies about heroes and the American like strongman pulling himself up by his bootstraps. And at the time, you're like, why the fuck are they, is everyone into this? But then 40 years later, a film critic is like, well, if you look at it with the history of the country, it like makes sense. Now, I hope that that is coming, Jeff. I hope we don't, just don't go into this weird, mindless, like spinning gyration of just trying to please ourselves, right? No, like, I think we're topping out. I, I think we're topping out on the craze. I hope so. I really hope so. <laughs> Like, the I don't thing want, is, like, I don't want these movies to go away. Like as well, like I don't yeah. want to rob people of things that they enjoy. Like people genuinely love these movies. Like now, do I find fucking thirty year old men child that have like fucking dioramas <laughs> of our Marvel <laughs> figurines and shit and, and Thanos's glove on there? I'm talking to you, Emmy <laughs> Um I, I just, I just, I, do I find that a little cringy? Yes, but that's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. But I don't want these movies to disappear. I don't want these people to lose what they love. I just want it to have its own category. That's you know part of a greater web of filmmaking yeah instead of just this dominant bubble that sits in the so for instance i was interviewing for a job a few years ago and me and the interviewer talked about how we both liked movies and at the time infinity war had come out and he asked me have you seen infinity war and i said no not yet and he goes oh well then you don't actually like movies and me wanting to you know, get this job. I didn't say anything, but inside I was saying, no, I'm actually into good movies. We're both into movies. You're just into shit. Yeah. Like, (laughs) and so that is the type of world that I don't want to live in. What I would like is it opening box office weekend, licorice pizza makes $150 million, but then the Superman or Batman movie also makes 150 million. That is totally fine with me. Right. That would be a good, nice little thing of parody with the content that is being digested by audiences. But when I see a Paul Thomas Anderson movie make $20 million and some Avengers movie make 400 plus, just in box office ticket sales, not even merchandising, it makes me cry a little inside. It makes me hurt. Dude, I was talking to my bro the other day, this guy that I know, and we were talking about movies and he was like... um, yeah, I mean, I only go to the theater for Star Wars movies. And I was like, oh, God, making <laughs> but, me die inside. But that's like, 
Really? I mean, at the state of these popcorn munching smell houses that theaters are nowadays, <laughs> uh, just this fucking kaleidoscopes of what's that smell. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just don't think that 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 should be really all theaters are for is to satisfy the popcorn munching masses. Like, just release all good content on streaming. Let me sit at home at my computer. I have a setup in my living room at now nowadays that I mean, in my opinion, is just as nice as a theater. Oh, nicer, yeah. And so it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just don't think that theaters, it, I, theaters should die, and if they don't, just let them be for Star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. Well, this is what I was gonna say a few minutes ago. Is like I think we're, we're there for me because all, all the pretty much all the things I ever want to watch, I can just watch at home. Like I don't. Like, we went to the theater and we regretted it, like, a couple weeks ago. Jeff and I did. We just, just feel done with it. I mean, maybe we'll go if there's something we really want to cover, mm-hmm. do Paul Thomas Anderson or something. But it's, like, my list of things I want to watch that are available just at my fingertips grows faster than I can watch them. So, while I do agree it's sad that, you know, a PTA movie isn't going to make money compared to Marvel, and that is kind of lame from my perspective as well. Like from a from a purely subjective standpoint, and from a very like just selfish perspective, I think cinema is in a great place because I can just watch everything I want from mm-hmm. home. No, I, true. I mean, it, there is a good byproduct of it, whereas like a lot of because now good films generally aren't released in theaters, or if they do, they don't do well. They're usually co-released on streaming services immediately. So there, mm-hmm. that is the benefit. Go ahead, Alex. Sorry. I no, of... I was going to say, I don't think we have the problem of like the Marvel universes or those types of films, like choking out the good films, right? We're not being inundated and it's not hard to find good movies and good stories to watch. Yeah, I think that what I'm saying is it's more of a like a prickly little sign or symptom of what I feel like is wrong with the way that society just ingests and consumes art in general. But that's a humongous conversation and discussion that has so many variables, yeah, I mean, right? Now, it's more of a symptom. Yeah. Even saying that, though, as I say that, I'm sure that when Lawrence of Arabia came out, which is considered to be one of the greatest films of all time, There was some prickly old man sitting on a hill somewhere who was like, why isn't anyone reading, you know, the Greek classics anymore? There's always going to be that like generational kind of gap that like we wish that we did things the older way or we wish that we we did things the way that were more sustenance, you know? You're like, when I was a kid, the stories that we had, cartoons when I was a kid was about... Yeah, well, we know we sound like exactly like fucking up like pedant- we know we sound like pedantic curmudgeons right now. Like we, that's why I rang the pedantic yeah. <laughs> bell. You know, like it's like we know what we sound like when we say these things. It still doesn't change the fact that there needs to be a level of appreciation for the deeper arts and other arts that I consider to be more shallow are valid. But like the deeper arts need to have a the same platform and what happens with these big movies is well if that's where the money is that's where the production's going so that's what's going to saturate the market Mm -hmm. and that's just unfair yeah and it's and i agree alex i think it's more of a symptom i think we're to use your kind of like great depression i think a lot of people want uh, to see heroes they want to see conflicts become resolved instead of kind of this perpetual cycle of repeat rinse repeat same like failure over Mm -hmm. and over again politically and i think that's a big symptom of why these movies are dominating the market is because people just want to see the good guy the ubermensch which never seems to happen exactly the ubermensch yeah there's there's appreciation on all levels of course it's it's harder to find somebody who's gonna appreciate just wilder like more niche cinema mm-hmm. than you know the Eternals or something mm-hmm. like that, but yeah, I don't know. I will say, Whatever. there was a trend <laughs> for a little while of like post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic like disaster movies, and now that we are in the midst of a global pandemic, climate devastation, society, political turmoil, whatever, it's not quite as fun. As Roland Emmerich made it out to be in The Day After Tomorrow. <laughs> no, uh, I, I've I've always held to the to the truth that nothing that Roland Emmerich Roland Emmerich has ever thought <laughs> was ever going to be good or true. This isn't Stargate. So, uh, 
this is this is great. We're bringing in the Roland Denmark bashing, and I didn't even have to do it. <laughs> yep, it's uh, that's yeah. a great way to round us out tonight. <laughs> I agree. Um, do we know what we're doing next week? Whose choice is it? Alex. Oh, Alex. That's right. We do not know what we're doing next week then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad I introduced this yeah. segment. <laughs> but it's 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 oh. a brewing. It's a yeah. Brewing. So that was uh, that was Blade of the Immortal by Takashi Miike and some other random nonsense at the end. But yeah, I I think you should watch this movie. Um, this episode will be out fairly soon, and it's available if you're listening to this in a timely uh time since we're releasing <laughs> it. It is on Prime Video. Yep. So, and I recommend if you want to see a fun ass movie, watch Definitely. this. Definitely. Yep. Watch it in a watch it in a timely time. <laughs> watch it in a timely time. Yeah, I'm good at words when I talk about movie <laughs> films. All right, Real Weirdos, the uh, most professional film podcast on the internet, rambling about movies for way too goddamn long. Signing off. Have a good one. Bye bye. See y'all next week. Chicka chicka chipo. Now our podcast is done. And we have to run. We know it is sad, but we had so much fun. Don't be bereft, Jesse, Alex, and Jeff. We'll be back real soon. The real weirdos. We talk about movies for way too goddamn long. Bo-bo-bo-bo. bo 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 b